uh, for today's seminar, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Nathalie Webb from Iraq, Toulouse. Uh, Nathalie got her PhD in 2000 from Kiel University in England, and then she moved for her postdoc to Toulouse, and she has stayed there ever since. Um, Nathalie has many institutional responsibility, and among them, maybe the most important one is that she has been head of the XMM Science and Survey uh, Center for now seven years. She started this uh, in 2014, and this is an association of 10 institutes, uh, so it's a big thing. She is also co eye of the SFOM mission and project scientist of the future Athena mission to be launched in 2021, something like that, hopefully. And in Toulouse, she has been head of the cosmology and high energy group from 2016 to 2020. And in Toulouse, uh, she's also teaching at the uh, university or also, and also at INSA Toulouse, which is an engineer school in Toulouse. And also in Toulouse, she is head of the Master II in astrophysics uh, now for several years. And her research covers many aspects of the physics of X-ray binaries. And she has studied X-ray binaries in a multi-wavelength perspective with an emphasis on X-ray observation, mainly using XMM-Newton mission, but not only XMM, also new star and other facilities. And she's especially a leader in the study and characterization of intermediate mass black holes, that is black hole uh, between stellar mass black hole and supermassive black hole to study how they form, how they grow. And this will be the topic of her talk today. So Nathalie, please. You can start Thank you. your seminar. Thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, let me just share your screen. Désolé, Nathalie, tu es, tu es muette, il faut que tu réactives ton micro. Yeah, sorry, it's done now. Okay. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's got Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you uh, to everyone for coming to the, to the seminar this morning. Um, so as uh, uh, Robert gave a very nice introduction, indeed, I will be talking about uh, the growth of supermassive black holes. And I'm gonna talk um, specifically um, about um, the transient sky. And I'll give you a few uh, different aspects of, um, of how we can use the transient sky to try and understand the growth of supermassive black holes. So the outline of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to give you a very small, short overview of the formation of supermassive black holes. Uh, I know this is a really big active uh, subject of research um, in your institute, so I'm sure you know a lot about this already. Um, I will talk about um, the seeds of these supermassive black holes, um, what we call intermediate mass black holes, uh, and where we hope to find them and how we can possibly find them. I'm going to talk a little bit about ultraluminous X-ray sources, mainly in the perspective of the fact that the, they can give us insight into the yet ununderstood, misunderstood um, aspect of some Freddington accretion. And I will also talk about hyperluminous X-ray sources. Um, I'll give you some information a bit about um, the X-Men Newton catalogue. As uh, Robert mentioned, I'm head of the ground segment for X-Men Newton. Um, and I'll talk about this resource as a way of discovering new uh, transient objects that can give us insight into the growth of uh, uh, black holes. So that'll be through um, different kinds of objects. Um, and I'll talk specifically about time disruption events and other transients that could be interesting. And uh, towards the end, I'll give some outline of prospects for the future for finding black holes. So, uh, how do supermassive black holes uh, form? Uh, I think we understand how stellar mass black holes form, um, so we could start there. Uh, with these are probably formed from at the end of the lives of the most massive stars um, and or through coalescence of uh, two neutron stars, for instance. So stellar mass black holes, I'm going to define to have masses of between three and maybe somewhere up to 100 stellar mass. It's obvious that supermassive black holes cannot form in the same way. We can't possibly form a few billion uh, mass, a solar mass star um, to, to form a supermassive black hole. 
Um, so intuitively, you might expect that perhaps uh, a stellar mass black hole that was formed right at the beginning of the universe could perhaps um, undergo sufficient uh, accretion to, to arrive at these uh, very big masses that we're seeing in the supermassive black hole. Um, but this is actually not true. Um, it would be very difficult to explain the whole population of supermassive black holes um, through uh, simply accreting onto a stellar mass black hole formed at the beginning of the universe. And that's even if you want to learn the maximal rate at which we'll be able to uh, accrete onto, uh, onto the black hole. So I'll come back to this uh, several um, times, the Eddington limit of uh, accretion. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Eddington limit, it's uh, quite simply the maximum rate at which we can accrete onto, uh, onto any kind of object, and I'm going to specifically talk about um, black holes during this, this talk. The reason being, as you accrete matter onto uh, a black hole, uh, matter will pass through an accretion disk as a way to, to lose the angular momentum that the material has, and as you accrete more and more matter onto the, onto the black hole, uh, the disk will become more and more luminous, until the radiation pressure becomes so high that it will actually oppose further matter falling onto the, onto the black hole. So this will then push back the, the material and will only be able to create. Uh, alors, um, in English, even. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll come back to the, the Eddington limit quite uh, a number of times during this talk. So. Um, as I said, the Eddington limit um, actually uh, supposes that we've got spherical accretion, which is probably not the the uh, the case when we're talking about accretion through uh, an accretion disk. But I'll come back to that uh, during the talk. So yeah, even accreting at this maximal rate is difficult to explain the population of uh, supermassive black holes, especially when we consider some of the supermassive black holes have got very, very high masses at very early times in the universe. So this is just a, a couple of uh, examples um, that are given in this, uh, and then these couple of lines on the slide. Uh, and there are obviously more examples, um, and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. So there have been different theories that have been proposed to, cre to, to create the supermassive black holes. Uh, there are a number of different theories that we could discuss um, this morning. Um, one of the theories is around uh, more massive seeds, so not stellar mass black holes, but what we call uh, intermediate mass black holes, which have got masses I'm going to define between about 100 and 100,000 solar masses. Um, and you could also imagine periods of super Eddington accretion, even if we're not sure how the physical me mechanism um, works for this kind of accretion uh, to form the supermassive black hole. So where do these uh, intermediate mass black holes come from, these seed uh, uh, black holes? Um, there's a couple of examples on this slide here. Uh, you could either imagine right at the, uh, the beginning of the universe when the metallicity was extremely low, uh, that massive stars could have been formed, more massive maybe than we observe today, that could collapse to form uh, uh, an intermediate mass black hole of, say, 100 solar masses or so. In the same way, um, a very, very low metallicity dust cloud could also collapse directly to form uh, an intermediate mass black hole, um, probably of a slightly higher mass and maybe around 10,000 solar masses. And then these objects can undergo accretion, they can undergo mergers, they may undergo, as I say, periods of super Eddington accretion, and we'd find um, we finally form some supermassive black holes. So this could be seen um, in this plot that I've taken from a paper by Green, sorry, Green with an E uh, at the end, uh, Strader and Home, uh, that was published last year. So on here, we actually see three different mechanisms for forming um, the seed black holes. So the seed black holes are formed in the early universe, um, and that's on the left-hand side of this plot. Uh, you can see um, uh, this indicated about uh, above uh, Z of, of 10. Uh, the first uh, line, these green, these green dots uh, are, are seed black holes or intermediate mass black holes that are formed through a gravitational one runaway that you can imagine, for instance, in a stellar cluster. The interaction of the objects within the stellar cluster would mean that the, the uh, energy would uh, thermalize so that all of the objects would have uh, very similar energy. The more massive objects, so either binary systems or compact objects, for instance, would fall towards the center. And then these will undergo um, successive mergers. Obviously, the objects could then undergo um, accretion and you'd be able to form some kind of intermediate mass black hole. You can also imagine um, 
these are the the population three stars that could have could form the in the intermediate mass black holes you can imagine qu there'd be quite a large number of these uh, objects in the very early universe or as i said earlier we could either have the, the, the direct collapse of uh, a low metallicity dust cloud and again mergers and accretion and we'd form um, different kind of populations of uh, of supermassive black holes so if you look at these plots on the right hand side and um, we'll start with the bottom one because that's the most intuitive to understand um, there are a number of things we do know about uh, the black holes the number of black holes the black hole fraction and um, the masses of these black holes so in the bottom plot we can see um, the galaxy mass which is plotted on the on the x-axis and the, the black hole mass on the y-axis and you can see that there's a, this correlation um, between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the black hole the more massive the galaxy the more the ma more massive uh, the black hole so in, in this plot this region that's gray is the region we don't know much about so that's saying the lower mass galaxies is unclear what uh, what the relationship with the black hole mass is. Does it continue to be fairly linear, or does it does it change at these uh, lower galaxy masses? Uh, we also got this uh, relationship between um, the galaxy mass and the black hole fraction. Are all galaxies um, seeded with some kind of uh, black hole in the in the center? Um, so uh, that would be this uh, this line here, or um, are we do we see some of the less massive galaxies um, that show uh, that, that there's no uh, black hole in their centers. And here we've got the mass function of the black hole uh, mass with the number. And again, we don't know what happens at the lower black hole masses. Does it continue to, to increase? Does it level off? Or perhaps it does just decrease? So these are kind of things we'd like to know. And we'd like to uh, understand these through observations um, and eventually to access the very earliest times in order to be able to constrain this region that's gray on the uh, on the, the left hand side of these plots. Um, so as I said, um, we'd expect to have some accretion and we'll have mergers, but without significant accretion or through recoil in some of the, the encounters, we'll expect some of these seeds to remain. So we'd be able to study some of these seeds that uh, remain in the local universe. And unfortunately, as I say, we're not yet able to access the, the highest redshift uh, intermediate, mass, intermediate mass black holes. Um, but yeah, if we can observe these intermediate mass black holes already in the local universe, it will give us uh, already some proof of their existence and also give us some indication about where they reside. We can then use this uh, information for simulations to understand what is going on in the earlier universe. And then, as I say, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about this towards the end, um, future observations that hope, hopefully allow us to access these highest redshift intermediate mass black holes and allow us to discern um, between the different kind of seeding mechanisms for uh, the supermassive black holes. So where should we look for these intermediate mass black holes? Well, intuitively, after what I've just said, um, in the centers of the lowest mass galaxies, as we saw that there was this scaling relationship between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the black hole. Um, we could also look in the outskirts of galaxies or galaxy clusters. Um, we're expecting our lower mass uh, black holes to merge with the more massive black holes. And therefore, we could find these intermediate mass black holes as they come in to merge with the more massive, uh, supermassive black holes that are in the centers of the galaxies. Obviously, if we could have, uh, we could expect maybe some intermediate ma mass black holes um, in stellar clusters. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done um, over the years to look for intermediate mass black holes in stellar clusters, and in including work that's been done um, at the IAP, and then no notably the work by uh, Eduardo Vitral and Gary Mamon recently. But to date, there's not really been an awful lot uh, of observational evidence to find intermediate mass black holes in, in stellar clusters. Historically speaking, people were very interested in what we call ultra-luminous X-ray sources, and I'll define these objects in a few moments. Um, but uh, these were thought to, uh, to contain intermediate mass black holes for quite a long time. Uh, I don't believe this is the case, which is why I've put them this place to look for your intermediate mass black hole um, in, in brackets. Um, but I will actually talk about ultra-luminous X-ray sources as they can give us an insight into the growth of supermassive black holes. The big problem is that the intermediate mass black holes are often accreting at very, very low rates. So they're very, very difficult to, um, to detect as they're often extremely faint. There's ways we can get around this. We could try and look for them when they go through periods of, uh, of high accretion. 
So um, I will talk about uh, specifically tidal disruption events, but there are other ways we can look for these objects as well. We could also identify the lowest mass galaxies through uh, uh, big optical surveys, for instance, and therefore try and identify the intermediate mass black hole at the centers of these low mass galaxies. Um, I'm actually not going to focus on this area uh, an awful lot during this talk, but it, it's an, a very um, active area of research and a lot of work has been done looking at the lowest mass galaxies, trying to identify the masses and the, the black hole fraction in these kinds of galaxies. The other thing that will be possible to do um, and has been done to some extent, but I think in the future will be extremely successful, is searching for signatures of low level accretion. As we've said that these objects are accreting very low rate, um, so we could perhaps look for compact jets uh, that are, are being um, emitted from these objects and future observatories um, such as the SKA, once the whole array will be online, will be exceedingly good for looking for low level accretion and therefore identifying intermediate mass black holes. So ULXs, why do I want to talk about them and what are they? First of all, let's start with what they are. Uh, ULXs are actually just quite simply defined as X-ray sources with luminosities above about 10 to the 39 um, ergs per second and located outside the nucleus of the host galaxy. That's to say they're not the supermassive black hole in a galaxy. There's some other source that's extremely bright. Why 10 to the 39? Uh, quite simply because uh, this is approximately the Eddington limit for a 10 solar mass black hole. And so they, these were originally thought to be objects that were much more massive than just 10 solar masses. They were believed to be black holes because the, we need a high mass to, uh, to create such a high luminosity. Uh, obviously, uh, the accretion, uh, the, the, the luminosity scales with the mass of the central uh, object. And so therefore, such a high mass can only be generated by such a, such a high, uh, high mass black hole. And in fact, Many of the ULXs were detected to be around 10 to the 40 or maybe 10 to the 40, even 10 to the 41 ergs per, per second. So we're, we're talking about black holes maybe with 100 or 1,000 solar masses uh, if these were accreting at the Eddington limit. And obviously, supposing that accretion is spherical and that we were accreting uh, hydrogen, which is why that these objects were originally thought to contain intermediate mass black holes. However, um, some galaxies show a large number of uh, ULXs, and you can see that in um, this plot on the right-hand side. This is an HST image taken from Geo et al. Uh, 2003. Um, the HST image is shown in color, and overplotted on that, we can see the X-ray contours of the uh, X-ray observations, and they indicate many, many bright X-ray sources, and these are actually the ULXs. As you can see, they're not the central um, uh, supermassive black hole, but they're scattered around in the in different areas around the, the galaxy. There are many reasons to believe that not all of these would have been intermediate mass black holes. Uh, one of the one reason which is fairly easy to, to, to understand by looking at this plot is um, it's difficult to reconcile the mass available for star formation and star formation array if you've got so many intermediate mass black holes in your galaxy. We also know that the emission can appear to exceed the Eddington limit if it's collimated. So you could imagine a geometrically thick accretion disk funneling material onto your, um, onto your black hole or your compact object in the center or, uh, or relativistic boosting. So if you're looking down, for instance, um, the jet that's, that's being emitted from your, from your system, then you'd see uh, uh, relativistic boosting and therefore you would appear to exceed the Eddington limit. So this was pretty much the, the our understanding of ULXs um, until about 2012. What happened in 2012? Um, well, that saw the launch of the, uh, the NASA SMEX mission called New Star. So New Star is a particularly interesting uh, observatory as it's able to focus uh, X-rays in the 3 to 80 kV domain. Uh, until then, um, ULXs have mainly been studied only until about 10 or 12 keV, uh, thanks to observatories like Chandra or uh, XMM Newton. Problem with this is that uh, many of the models that have been used to try and understand uh, ULXs, to try and understand their nature, 
are actually very, very similar if uh, we look uh, only in the 0.2 to 10 or 12 kV uh, domain. And that's what you can see on this uh, spectrum that you're looking at on this slide. So what you can see plotted on uh, here are the data points um, observed from one of the very typical ULXs, NGC 1313X1, uh, observed with XMEM Newton. So this is the black points and you can see the error bars on the, on the, on the data. And what you can see plotted on here are some of the different models that have been proposed to try and understand the, the physical nature behind the emission from ULXs. So there's some different models you can see on here. You can see like a purple dashed line, um, and this is indicating a Comptonization uh, uh, model for the, the ULXs. Uh, we get obviously um, uh, high energy uh, photons emitted from the accretion disk, which will interact with uh, uh, even higher energy uh, corona. This is some kind of plasma around the black hole, scattering the, the photons to even higher energies. And therefore you would expect that your emission would um, increase as you, uh, as you go to the higher energies uh, in the spectrum. Another model um, that was used to explain the um, uh, the emission observed from ULXs is this uh, green dashed line here. We believe that we're looking at uh, black holes. We therefore can expect to have uh, uh, emission uh, around the, the iron line, so the 6.4 uh, uh, keV line, excuse me. And this would therefore have a suffer uh, very strong relativistic effects and you would expect to see uh, a very highly broadened uh, iron line and that could explain why we're seeing um, strong emission up in these higher energies. Another explanation for uh, the uh, X-ray emission we're seeing is the fact that we might be um, observing um, super Eddington accretion and that's this uh, red model here that you can see with a red solid line. Um, that's represented by um, a disk black body and this cutoff power law. So it was difficult to distinguish between or any of these models using just the XMM or Chandra data. Um, and then NewStar was launched and you can see, and you saw just very briefly, um, these are the points um, that were uh, data points that come from the NewStar observations of this uh, ULX, NGC 1313. And you can see that they strongly favor this super Reddington uh, emission onto ULXs. And in fact, our, we had a large program uh, put in place uh, right from the outset with NewStar to try and observe a number of different ULXs in this ha uh, hard energy um, domain. And in fact, we see the same thing for um, the other ULXs that we've observed. So this strongly favors that we've got some kind of super Eddington accretion that's going on within the ULXs. And this is interesting, as I said, if you're interested in understanding the physical mechanism behind the super Eddington accretion to understand the growth of supermassive black holes. So uh, in 2013, uh, we assume that we're seeing super uh, Eddington accretion to some extent onto, uh, onto black holes uh, in these ULXs. But then uh, we had uh, a very unexpected, um, already an unexpected uh, observation and then some unexpected results. Uh, in 2014, January 2014, there was a type 1a um, a supernova that went off in M82, which is a nearby galaxy. And so one of the aims of New Star was to observe a type 1a uh, supernova in a nearby galaxy. And so New Star turned to observe uh, M82 for uh, two megaseconds. Um, so those of you do uh, uh, optical uh, ob observations is something like 48 nights. So it's a very long uh, observation. And we're lucky enough that uh, in M82, there's a number of different ULXs. So we started to analyze the data that came from this very long observation um, and to look at the different ULXs in there. And the one I'd like to highlight here is, um, is M82, excuse me. M82 uh, X2. This has a maximal uh, X-ray luminosity of about uh, two times ten to the forty ergs per second. So uh, we're we presumed we're about a factor ten above um, above the Eddington limit for this for this source. However, during our, our analysis, we discovered a pulse period, and the pulse period was about one point three seven uh, seconds. And it was extremely significant. We're at thirty sigma, and you can see that. Um, in this, uh, this is the period um, 
uh, that you can see um, in this second plot on the left hand side. And you may expect that that comes from, say, an, I don't know, a QPO in the disk around, uh, around the black hole, except we also observed a very, very strong spin up. Um, that's to say that the, the period got shorter very rapidly with time and the spin up we observed with this uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 10 seconds per second. Very high spin up. This couldn't happen for a black hole as there's no solid surface, um, so we can't transfer the angular momentum directly onto uh, onto a solid surface and spin up the object. And therefore, the only kind of object this could be coming from is from a neutron star. So this is quite surprising um, because a neutron star has got a mass of about 1.4 solar masses, which means that in fact, if, instead of being a factor 10 above Eddington, we're a factor 100 above Eddington. Um, we're also been able to use um, the fact that we find a sinusoidal dual period uh, in the data about two and a half days, um, very small eccentricity, no eclipses uh, in, in the data. Therefore, we can infer if we assume a 1.4 solar mass uh, neutron star, we can infer a mass for the, the companion star, which is about five solar masses. And to date, uh, it's been very difficult to access uh, the masses of the, of the companion stars in ULXs, quite simply because these are in different galaxies and makes it very difficult to observe. So not only we found um, that, in fact, we're not accreting onto a black hole in this system, uh, we're also accreting about 100 times uh, Eddington, and that for a long period of time. So that's great. Maybe it's just this system was particular, and we're finding uh, that, there, that there's a neutron star only in M82 um, X2. Um, but since then, so this is that since 2014, we found that there's another six ULXs show these kinds of pulsations. So we have another six ULXs that are definitely um, containing neutron stars. In fact, there's been a huge amount of work that's been done um, since that time. Uh, and lots of people have um, been proposing that actually maybe the majority of the ULXs actually contain neutron stars rather than black holes for a number of different reasons. Um, and so uh, it means that when these ULXs really are creating a, a large fraction above Eddington, and they could be very interesting to study to try and understand the physical mechanism behind this super Eddington accretion. So it's generally agreed that ULX is um, below about 10 to the 41 ergs per second uh, are creating onto some kind of uh, stellar mass uh, compact object, and possibly many of them might be accreting onto neutron stars. It's only once you get up to the much higher luminosities, um, the more extreme ULXs, which are called hyperluminous X-ray sources or HLXs, um, that it's thought that they could possibly um, house some kind of more massive black hole in, in their center. And I'll come back on to that in a few moments. So ideally we'd, be able to, we'd like to be able to find uh, more of these objects. And one area we can try and, uh, try and exploit is to take uh, X-ray catalogs. So these are catalogs of all the serendipitous detections made by uh, the different X-ray observatories to date. Um, I'm going to talk uh, specifically about the catalog um, that, we've with, with, that we create uh, on a yearly basis um, with the XMM mutant data. So the latest version of this catalog is called 4XMM DR10. It's the 10th data released um, of, the, of the data in the XMM uh, Newton archive. The data in this catalog um, actually spans a huge amount of time. And that's particularly interesting, especially if we're gonna look for some kind of transient events, if we're looking at uh, objects that vary um, over, the, over the long time scales. So the data we've got are from February 2000 up to December uh, 2019. It's a very large catalog. Um, there's almost 80, uh, oh, no, there's an, a nine missing out of that, sorry. There's about 849,000 uh, 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 detections. And some of those objects have been detected up to 74 times. Obviously, as some of the objects have been detected many, many times, this is about half a million unique X-ray sources. And we also provide many, many data products for these objects. Um, and including spectra and light curves of the brightest objects, about 303,000. Uh, of the sources have got spectra and light curves. You can see the distribution of the X-ray sources in the catalog um, on this plot here. It's in a Hammer 8 of uh, uh, display. So this is the center of the galaxy at the center of the plot. We've got the plane of the galaxy um, along this axis and then the rest of, uh, of the universe um, in the rest uh, of, of the field of view. Uh, 
We do many things. We provide cross correlation with 222 multi wavelength catalogs to try and identify the sources. Um, and just for information, it covers 1,192 uh, 1, uh, square degrees of sky. This is actually the biggest um, X ray catalog currently uh, in terms of uh, X ray sources. Uh, obviously, the e Rosita catalog, once it will be uh, published, will probably uh, be larger than this. Um, but to date, this is the largest resource with uh, uh, X ray sources from a single observatory. It means that the catalog is extremely interesting for accessing uh, data products very quickly. You can find fluxes, spectra, images, all kinds of different kinds of information um, in the catalog. But it's also very interesting for finding new objects, and I shall talk about that in a few moments. Um, it's also very interesting for doing um, population studies. Uh, you can find uh, very large populations of certain types of uh, systems within the, within the catalog. And it's also interesting for doing cross-correlation for multi-wavelength studies, for instance. Just as an aside, um, this the catalog is going to evolve very strongly over the next three years. We've been recently awarded um, an H2020 program, um, which is called Exmento Athena, to try and um, improve the software and the products that we use for XMM um, and provide for XMM in the optic of pr producing something extremely robust already for Athena, which will be uh, uh, flying hopefully um, 2033, uh, 2034, uh, around there. So one of the objects we found in this catalog, um, this, is, this is going back a long time now, um, back in 2008, is this very bright ULX, which is formerly a, a hyperluminous X-ray source. And we actually called it hyperluminous X-ray source one. Uh, it's the first one discovered in this galaxy, which is ESO243-49. So this galaxy here um, is ESO243-49. This is a six band image taken with HST. And the source we're interested in is this one here, which doesn't look particularly bright um, in the optical and the UV, but when you look at the X-rays, it is very bright. It's got an X-ray luminosity of more than one times 10 to the 42 ergs per second. So if this was a stellar mass a black hole, um, we'd be a, a thousand times above uh, the Eddington limit. We've associated this uh, galaxy, this um, this source with this uh, host galaxy, um, ESO243-49, using optical spectroscopy. It's not clear whether it's actually in the galaxy or if it's just um, interacting with the galaxy. Um, but it, in whichever case, it is actually associated to some degree with, with this uh, galaxy, ESO243-49. So we have a lot of different data ranging from the radio to um, the gamma ray. I'll present some of the data over the next few slides. Um, but what you can see in this bottom plot is the X-ray light curve of, uh, of this source HLX1 over the long term, starting from 2008 when we first discovered uh, the source in the catalog, going to um, this last data point is just an upper limit. Um, and that was taken last week. Uh, so this is spanning 13 years of data. What's immediately obvious is that it shows bright times and very faint times, um, rising to bright and then coming down again, um, initially with a fairly periodic time scale. Um, in fact, this was almost exactly one year and the outbursts were occurring every year uh, in August, which was a little bit annoying because every time uh, it went into outburst, we found ourselves during holidays uh, frantically writing proposals to, to get new observations. Uh, that was the case until um, 2012, and in 2013, actually, the uh, outburst was delayed by six weeks. Uh, the outburst occurred in September. Well, it was fairly, it was fairly regular, but not so regular, and we didn't think a great deal of it <clears throat> until the year later. The next outburst was delayed by three months with respect to a, with respect to one year, and then this one uh, was delayed by more than a year. And in fact, since the, the last outburst, it's been actually four years now. Um, you might think this looks like it's going into an outburst. We actually had another observation yesterday, and it is clearly not going into an outburst. So don't get overexcited. So what else um, do we know about this, uh, about this source? Um, we find that when it gets extremely bright, the spectrum becomes very um, uh, thermal very much like the X-ray binaries. When you look at an X-ray binary and they go into outbursts, we see a very soft thermal uh, disk-like spectrum. And when they drop down into the fainter state, we see this very hard power law um, with a gamma of about 1.7. 
So it seems to, to show outbursts very similar to the black hole X-ray binaries. Uh, we see very, very similar spectra to these black hole X-ray binaries, um, except that we are a factor of thousand um, brighter in, in, the, in the luminosity. So that's just, you can see that um, in this plot here, taken from a paper um, written with Mathieu Servia in, back in 2011. This is some of the X-ray spectra you can see when it's very, very uh, bright, you see this very soft thermal spectrum. And when it's in the, the faintest state, we see this very hard uh, power law spectrum. So we've modeled this uh, spectra, not just the, the data that's presented here, but uh, the extra data that um, we've taken since with different kinds of uh, relativistic disk models and all of our masses, con uh, cluster around 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 solar, solar masses for this for the black hole in the center of this of this system. So we're looking at an object that's got a, a, a mass in the intermediate mass black hole uh, uh, range. The reason for the, such a large range is because we can't constrain the, the spin, for instance, of the black hole. It appears to accrete uh, near uh, Eddington in the in the brightest state, but it doesn't seem to go uh, above Eddington uh, significantly. Um, one thing to note as well is that the, the spectri spectral evolution is totally incompatible with beaming. Um, so it's, we don't see this very bright luminosity because of beaming. Um, and that can be seen by the fact that here we're seeing a very uh, soft spectra when the source is bright. If it was, if we're seeing uh, the brightening due to beaming, we'd expect the spectrum to become much harder. So as I mentioned, it seems to behave like a, a black hole X-ray binary. Um, and this is a plot taken from um, Sarah Markov. And you can see how the black hole X-ray binaries evolve with time. So this is the X-ray uh, luminosity um, with respect to the hardness. So uh, hard spectrum and the soft spectrum on the left-hand side. And they show this, um, this kind of uh, plot uh, that uh, always comes back to uh, this very uh, low hard state evolves through a softer state and comes back again. Uh, in this hard state and the black hole X-ray binaries, we see compact jets um, emitted um, from around the, the accretion disk. Uh, and then as the system evolves in black hole X-ray binaries, it crosses what we call this jet line. And then we see these, uh, these relativistic uh, um, jets that are uh, highly transient and they're much much brighter um, often a factor 100 or so brighter than these compact jets as we were seeing uh, an evolution that was extremely similar to the black hole x-ray binaries we tried to look to see if we'd find um, these jets we couldn't see the compact jets um, from hlx1 in a low hard state because of the distance uh, there's no uh, radio telescope that's specific sufficiently sensitive to be able to detect them. So we try to detect the, these um, transient jets we see as it crosses the jet line. So in this bottom, bottom right-hand plot, you can see uh, ESO 243 in the black and white uh, image, the radio contours, uh, and this is the supermassive black hole in ESO 243-49. HLX1 is here, and we detect absolutely nothing um, in the low hard state as one would expect. As we um, cross the jet line in this evolution um, during our evolving light curve, um, we can see that there is actually some transient emission that occurs uh, exactly the position of HLX1, uh, significance of uh, 8.2 uh, sigma, about 45 uh, microjanskis, um, confirming that this, this source really does behave like black hole X-ray binaries, and it really does not behave in any way like a ULX. So how do we explain um, this variability that we saw? Um, first of all, that we're seeing um, a very uh, similar spectra to the black hole X-ray binaries. It's much brighter, obviously, but we're seeing uh, outbursts that seem to come um, spaced in time um, by a much longer duration. Well, um, we did some modeling back uh, in 2014. This is what we did with Olivier Godish. Um, and we modeled an intermediate mass black hole of about 10 to the four solar masses with some kind of companion star. And uh, we showed it was possible to capture a star in the cluster, for instance, um, that was initially at infinity, is captured and forms a binary system. The period diminishes and then starts to increase again. Um, we see the four different kinds of uh, companions that we tried. Um, and 
these are just some of the points that are plotted here. You can see, for instance, a zoom of the pink curve uh, of here. This is the number of orbits um, on the x-axis, and this is the orbital period on the y-axis. So actually, this seems to describe very, very much so what we um, what we've observed with HLX1. Um, we saw we were in this sort of situation where we see an, uh, an orbital period which um, is very, very uh, uh, flat, so almost the same uh, orbital period for several years until it started to get longer and longer. And this we could expect because as due to tidal forces between the 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 star that's orbiting uh, the intermediate mass black hole in, in HLX1. Uh, energy will be injected into the system, causing um, it to become uh, more and more separated from the, uh, from the intermediate mass black hole until it's eventually um, injected from the system. Uh, and we no longer see uh, emission as matter is ripped from the star as it uh, approaches periastron. So this is very much like um, some kind of tidal disruption event, but a failed tidal disruption event in as much as in a tidal disruption event, normally the star is totally uh, disrupted and about half the material is accreted onto uh, the massive black hole. Uh, this star seems to resist um, being completely disrupted as it only passes at um, a periastron passage um, at the tidal radius, and so only a part of the, of the, the material is ripped off the, off the star. We try to understand what the nature of the object is uh, in which uh, HLX1 is embedded. Um, we can detect a stellar cluster around uh, HLX1. We try to model to, to determine whether it's a young cluster or an old cluster. This is data, this is some work we did back in 2012. We have some extra data now that we're currently looking at. Uh, what you see here is the, um, the X-ray data and UV to the infrared taken with HSD. We've modeled with a stellar cluster and an accretion disk. You see the accretion disk is particularly bright in the X-rays. But we're unable to distinguish whether or not it's a yellow, young stellar cluster or an old stellar cluster. You can see the, um, the fit um, in, at the bottom of the, of the slide. We are clear that there is um, a stellar cluster around a million um, solar masses around the, the intermediate mass black hole. Um, but uh, whether or not it's, it's young or old, hopefully the new uh, HSD data, which cover nine different bands and are observing the source in the very, very uh, low state. So we've got very little contribution from the disk. We'll be able to um, distinguish between the different models. How did the source get there? You could imagine perhaps that there's some kind of merger between a, a dwarf galaxy and the host galaxy ESO243-49. We tried to determine that by looking for tidal tails with uh, um, uh, H1 observations. We didn't determine um, any, we didn't find any tidal tails. So we used the Muse uh, IFU on the VLT to try and look at the, at the, cluster, at the galaxy to see if we're seeing any evidence of a merger. So what you're seeing in these plots here is the velocity distribution of ESO243-49. This is the position of uh, HLX1 shown with the, uh, the black cross. And you can see the rotation of uh, ESO243-49, so the, the material coming towards us in the blue and, the, and that uh, receding in the red. And you see there's no specific change around the position of HLX1 and not in the dispersion um, diagram either. There's also no difference in the age uh, around the position of HLX1 and nor in the metallicity. Um, so we're not seeing any evidence, unfortunately, for any kind of merger that might have brought um, H HLX1 and its stellar cluster um, to be situated where it is uh, in ESO243-49. So the data that we've got um, seem to point towards some kind of failed tidal disruption event. Um, there may be some other models that have that could that have tried to describe HLX1, uh, but they failed to take into account that the totality of the data that we've got in hand to try and describe the the system, and it seems to be uh, one of the better uh, descriptions of HLX1 is through this failed tidal disruption event. Uh, it's possibly due to a merger um, between the, the dwarf galaxy and, um, and ESO243-49, which may have knocked one of the uh, cluster stars off its original trajectory and called it, caused it to be um, 
uh, caught by the gravitational field of the intermediate mass black hole. And indeed, tidal disruption events, um, more dis tidal disruption events have been detected in galaxies that have undergone a merger. This system's only been bright for about 30 years. Um, it wasn't detected with ROSAT and should have been. Um, and well, at the moment, it doesn't look like it's particularly bright uh, nowadays. So it looks like it's a, got a maximum lifetime about 30 years, which would indicate there must be other systems like this one um, out there to be discovered. So moving on to actual tidal disruption events. Um, so full tidal disruption events, as I say, this happens when a star comes too close to a massive, a massive uh, a black hole. Um, we see these tidal disruption events for uh, for black holes where the uh, mass is below 10 to the 8 solar masses, uh, quite simply because otherwise the the the, the disruption occurs within site within the event horizon, so we can't actually observe it. As uh, we're looking at uh, the mass distribution below 10 to the 8, uh, some of these can be coming from, for instance, uh, intermediate mass black holes, um, and therefore we'd be able to identify intermediate mass black holes that normally would not be very bright um, because they're creating at low rates. But, but once they become very bright through the tidal disruption event, we'd be able to identify them. And um, these objects are not particularly common, but we do know a lot of galaxies, which means we do detect um, a lot of tidal disruption. We could detect potentially a lot of tidal disruption events um, in the in the local universe, um, but to date only a, about 100 or so uh, tidal disruption events have been uh, detected. So in the in the in the Exxon catalog, we've actually found a number of different um, tidal disruption events, um, and I'm just going to show a selection of a few that we found. Um, you can see um, this is what the first one uh, that our group discovered back in 2011. This is a very typical X-ray spectrum of a tidal disruption event. Again, it's got this very soft disk-like um, uh, spectrum. Um, I just like the power law that you can see here. Um, tidal disruption events have got fairly uh, typical light curves. They rise to a peak, and then they tend to fall off with approximately a luminosity proportional to T, the time, um, to the minus 5 thirds, which is what this line here is drawn on there. So we don't have many observations of this one, and that's a problem, and I'll come back onto that point in a few moments. Um, but actually, the data we have in hand and modeling um, this X-ray emission shows that this uh, tidal disruption event um, could have been around something that is close to something like an intermediate mass black hole, which, which uh, was interesting, and in, uh, just to go and look for some other ones. So this is another one we found. Um, we've got much better data for this uh, tidal disruption event. Um, you can see um, the X-MEM observations in the, with the red triangles, Chandra observations in blue, Swift observations in green, and you can see the um, X-ray spectra um, as they evolve with time. This is the source um, it's found here. It's colored in uh, purple, just uh, <laughs> using the, uh, the uh, X-ray uh, uh, observation on top of the optical image of this galaxy cluster. And modeling this, uh, these X-ray spectra, we actually find that the, the black hole is quite a high spin and that the mass seems to be um, comprised between about five times 10 to the four and one times 10 to the five solar masses. So this seems to be evidence, possible evidence for another intermediate mass black hole um, through uh, observations of a tidal disruption event. Work has been done also, also by Chen and Shen um, by modeling the X-ray light curve, um, not the spectra in this case, and they come up with a mass of about seven times 10 to the four solar masses, which is totally compatible um, with, the, with the mass that we determined. This is another tidal disruption event that we discovered. Um, now, this is not around an intermediate mass black hole, but what is interesting is that we're not seeing this um, luminosity decay with, t with time um, proportional, uh, the luminosity proportional to time to the minus five thirds. But actually, um, this tidal disruption event stays bright for a very long time. In fact, it seems to be um, at least at the Eddington limit for about uh, a decade or so. Why this should happen is not particularly clear. This might be because um, the, the mass of the star was extremely where it was extremely high, um, for instance, much more massive than other tidal disruption events that we've observed, or for some reason that much more of the mass has been absorbed, but it's not clear um, if either of these reasons are, are the case. What is interesting is, though, that this source has actually undergone uh, super Eddington accretion, or at least Eddington accretion, for a long period of time. And again, this is extremely interesting um, 
if we want to try and understand the growth of supermassive black holes. Uh, there are many other t uh, t tidal disruption events that could be detected within the uh, XMM catalogue. Uh, notice I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll go through this very quickly. Um, so this is some work that did a couple of years ago um, to show that we'll probably we'd expect quite a few tidal disruption events within the X Men Newton catalog. And in fact, we have discovered about uh, a dozen or so of these objects. But it requires really rapid follow up to be able to, first of all, um, prove that these were a tidal disruption event and also to constrain the tidal disruption event uh, nature. So something we're trying to put into place, which is actually very interesting um, in the framework of time domain astronomy, which is, is becoming to really at the forefront of, of, of the observational techniques that have been used, uh, that are being used re uh, recently, and especially with uh, the detection of gravitational uh, wave events and the, the implementation of observatories like LSST um, or Rubin Observatory that will be uh, coming online in the next few years, is to try and exploit the variable sky with XMM Newton. So XMM wasn't uh, launched as, a, as an observatory to survey the, the variable sky. It's been in orbit for 21 years now, um, so we've got this very long baseline, and it would be interesting to try and look for sources that actually vary on the long term and actually provide an alert to the users um, as the data come to the ground, rather than waiting for a whole year uh, during the proprietary period. So this is something we're looking into at the moment. We've been developing code to do this, and obviously this would require um, having the permission of the PI at some point, um, allowing us to publish if a, tr a significantly tr uh, transient object uh, is discovered in their data to publish at least the position and some basic information for people to follow up. And this would be interesting, obviously, for tidal disruption events, but also to follow up other transients. So for instance, gravitational wave events, gamma ray bursts, cataclysmic variables, supernovae, X-ray binary outbursts, et cetera, et cetera. So just to show you um, what we've been doing um, to try and put this into place, and this is work that's been done uh, with my PhD student, um, Awan Kantan. Um, this is uh, an object uh, found in the X-Men Newton catalog. Um, this is a, a light curve of this object, um, which is not particularly interesting because we've only got one detection. So this is the air time and this is the X-ray flux. And this is the flux that we detected at this specific moment. Uh, it seems a fairly unremarkable, unidentified object because we've only got a single, uh, a single data point. However, something that's not been um, exploited are the upper limits. So if we add now into it, um, this plot the upper limits from all the other pointings taken of this object, and you can see them here, um, these are the upper limits, and this is the, the detection that we had in the previous plot something's happened, this source has been, is, is, is particularly variable. If we now add in um, data that comes from all the other X-ray observatories, and that's what you can see here now. So this is the original data point. These were the upper limits we had with XMM, and now you're seeing swift data, which confirms that there was some kind of outburst at this point, and then Chandra data, which gives us a very deep upper limit. You can see that this is a highly transient source that would not have um, been discovered previously. Not only that, it happens to be um, a ULX um, in, the, in the galaxy NGC 7793. And in fact, the data was sufficient that we could determine that there were actually pulsations in this, uh, in this, um, in this source. So we found actually uh, this was the seventh uh, pulsating ULX um, that's been discovered. It's actually particularly interesting, this source, because actually it's the second one that's been discovered in NGC 7793. There are five uh, ULXs known within this uh, galaxy. So two of them are now being confirmed to be uh, neutron star ULXs, which is interesting. And two of the others are also highly transient, which seem to be a characteristic of the neutron star ULXs. And so they, they might also con uh, contain neutron stars and therefore supporting this idea that many of the ULXs actually contain a neutron star rather than just uh, the black hole as originally um, uh, proposed. So going back to our intermediate mass black holes, there are many, many different ways to search for them. Um, I mentioned a few at the beginning, um, some recent work that was done by um, Igor uh, Chilingarian back in 2018, fitted uh, many, many different uh, uh, SESS uh, observed uh, galaxies and found um, 
from the velocity dispersion, 305 different objects that look like they possibly could have an intermediate mass black hole as the central uh, massive black hole in the galaxy. Obviously, follow-up observations will be needed to confirm that, but there's an extremely interesting sample already um, to try and identify more intermediate mass black holes. Eresita, um, as you know, has been in orbit now for a couple of years and has been surveying the sky. Um, it's been proposed that many thousands of uh, new tidal disruption events could be discovered with Eresita. Um, the preliminary results show that there are not as many TDs detected as were expected. This might give us some uh, information about the spin of the black hole in these TDs as well as giving us information about the number of TDEs, um, but there will be a number of TDEs that will be interesting to study um, with the eResita data. As I mentioned before, um, there's the Rubin Observatory. Um, many, many uh, TDEs have been detected in the optical, especially since we, there's been the PTF and the ZTF. Um, about half the TDEs now have been detected in the optical. Uh, it's been proposed that the Rubin Observatory uh, will detect about 5,000 per year, per year. So many of these could um, house intermediate mass black holes. The SKA, as I mentioned earlier, we could find the intermediate mass black holes in our own galaxy in the low state through these compact jets, or maybe other jet ejection ev events like we saw with HLX1 or by, that have been observed from other low mass um, massive black holes like ARP-299. Obviously, there'll be new transients um, that will be detected, including TDs and ULXs with SFOM um, and Thesis if it gets chosen. And in the future, um, both with Athena and obviously um, the Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, LISA, which will be a fantastic resource to, to identify uh, intermediate mass black holes. So as I'm pretty much out of time, uh, that, that brings me to my summary. So. Um, I hopefully shown you that finding and studying intermediate mass black holes is essential for our understanding um, of the origin and the evolution of supermassive black holes. I think ULXs are going to be very interesting to study to try and understand the physical nature behind the super Eddington accretion. Um, and this again is important for understanding of the growth of supermassive black holes. Probably only the very brightest ULXs could possibly uh, uh, house an intermediate mass black hole. So they're probably not the place to specifically look for uh, intermediate mass black holes. But HLX1 does appear to contain an intermediate mass black hole of about 20,000 solar masses. I think tidal disruption events are going to be an excellent way to identify uh, faint uh, intermediate mass black holes that uh, are out there that will become um, bright over, over a period of time. And I think Hopefully, I've shown you that we have got some very interesting intermediate mass black holes uh, candidates that have been discovered recently, and these will be followed up to uh, to determine if they really are uh, uh, intermediate mass black holes. Systematic near real time um, X ray searches should reveal more intermediate mass black holes um, through the discovery and the study of tidal disruption events. And as I mentioned, many future observations um, will re reveal a really significant population of these uh, seed black holes and hopefully give us an insight into how supermassive black holes are formed and evolve. So, thank you for your attention. So Thank you very much, Nathalie, for this uh, very interesting and pedagogical seminar. So it's now time for questions. So I see there is only already one question by, by Felix. So please, Felix, unmute your mic and ask your question. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very, <laughs> very uh, wonderful talk and overview. I have uh, two questions. <clears throat> one is... Uh, for instance, in the case of stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, the mass, uh, there are cases where the mass has been determined dynamically. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in, uh, in stellar mass black holes, there are three objects that uh, beyond any doubt, they are, uh, we know the, the mass range and uh, also in Sagittarius A star. Uh, we know uh, because of dynamics of the stars around. So the first question is, uh, what is the possibility that that could be done, uh, determine the mass dynamically 
uh, of uh, intermediate mass black holes. And the second uh, uh, question is, uh, could we solve uh, few intermediate mass black holes uh, uh, detected uh, without any doubt because they are just transient objects in the formation of uh, supermassive black holes from stellar mass black holes. Uh, and uh, if that is the case, they will have been formed mostly in very early epochs of the universe. So these are the two questions uh, that I have to you, yes. Okay, yeah, um, they're both very good questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so for determining the, um, the mass of the intermediate mass black holes with uh, uh, dynamical measurements. I think the ELT will be uh, really instrumental in this. It should give us uh, spectra that will be allow us to detect um, uh, the optical companion, for instance, um, around maybe some intermediate mass black holes um, of the of the closest ones. Um, so I think there is hope that with, within the next few years we might be able to to make some kind of a good estimate of the the dynamical mass of the of these systems. Um, with regards to the second question, um, I wasn't quite clear exactly what you wanted to know. Could you rephrase? Yes, you, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that uh, to account for the supermassive black holes seen in quasars at ranges up to 7.5, uh, there, there is the hypothesis that uh, this uh, very massive uh, black holes, supermassive black holes in quasars, high redshift quasars, were formed through a uh, phase of uh, intermediate mass black hole formed from stellar mass black holes. This is, uh, uh, well, I know that is controversial. We don't see how they form, but uh, this is one of the of the current model, and I think is the so uh, the idea is that if intermediate mass black holes are formed by uh, super Eddington accretion from stellar mass black holes, uh, then they are transient objects. They are in in uh, in an environment where they will accrete super Eddington like crazy. So they will turn uh, relatively rapidly into supermassive black holes. And this is why we don't see them uh, usually uh, as frequently as we should see them. This is why, uh, this is my second question. Yeah, indeed. Um, mind you, uh, I think it'd be pretty difficult to detect these intermediate mass black holes, even if they're going through a super Eddington uh, accretion phase um, at the at very, very high redshifts. So yeah, this will be work for future observatories or yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say probably only the future observatories will be able to access these very high redshifts um, to be able to, to get a good handle on, on what's going on. But yeah, I think uh, I think the jury's still out on, on how these supermassive black holes are formed. Um, it's difficult to, to determine. And um, there's a lot of observational work to still be done and also probably a lot of uh, simulations as well. Marta. Thank you. So fantastic work. It's always, I mean, it, it's always amazing to see all this. Um, and especially if I can say, you know, the clever ways of using the data, I, I just adore it. Um, but uh, just a quick question on the second uh, tidal disruption. No, I mean, well, the tidal disruption event that it presented <coughs> just <coughs> sorry, just after HLX, mm -hmm. the one that was also of center. And in that case, do you see any uh, stellar cluster around the source or not? Um, yeah, for the, all of the tidal disruption events, uh, we detect a galaxy. Um, uh, in which the, the 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 black hole is at the center. Um, uh, so, so, I thought, uh, so the, it was the second of, um, I think. So after HLX, you showed another uh, the the Linetol paper thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you want me to put the slides back on? You could. Sorry. That's My good. Um,
this one here? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, uh, so we, we detect the galaxy. Um, this is the name of the galaxy um, here. It's an in in inactive galaxy. But you uh, see also, so for, for HLX1, you also see a nuclear, a, a stellar cluster. I mean, you, can, you cannot yeah, determine. Absolutely, yeah. But in this case, exactly. In this case, do you also see a, a stellar enhancement near the source? Um, no, uh, this one we just detect the galaxy as a whole, okay. so it's it's not off center at all. This is right in the center oh, of the okay, galaxy. Sorry. Yeah, the, none of these the tidal disruption events that I presented, none of them are off center at all. They're all okay. they're exactly coincident with the center of the galaxy, Except but they're all in HLX. lower mass galaxies. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. So, Norma. I mute, unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie. From all this uh, um, very wide uh, um, set of observations uh, you clearly displayed in X, uh, and now with the uh, optical observations, uh, radio, um, and also gravitational waves, uh, which are, uh, I mean, how much uh, all the mm, physical parameters for intermediate black holes and the picture we have now, I mean, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, infer, for instance, um, masses, uh, spins, uh, magnetic fields with uh, polarization, I think is very interesting and in which magnitude uh, you, you attach for that. This is uh, one question, and 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 more. I mean, uh, also the equation of a state uh, to characterize the equation of states. I mean, of these in, uh, intermediate black holes and globular clusters. More. I mean, the 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 host. Uh, the I mean, the environment, and if possible, also the. Uh, the, the, the correlations, mass, uh, intermediate black holes, uh, globular clusters, and um, scaling laws. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thank you for the question. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we're just in, at least um, looking at from the observational side of things, uh, I think we're just starting to make good constraints uh, on the on the masses of these intermediate mass black holes um, and where they're found, uh, I, there are very very few uh, intermediate mass black holes that have really been truly confirmed. Um, so I've tried to present you some good candidates. Um, some of these might require still uh, further observations to be able to confirm them. It's interesting we're finding more and more. Uh, I think we're starting to get a better understanding of where these objects reside. But I don't think we're quite, unfortunately, at the at the point where we can um, that we can make any generalization about the parameterization of these intermediate mass black holes. Um, so, and definitely, we're not quite there with things like the spin. I would really hope that um, with the work we're doing at the moment to try and to identify, for instance, tidal disruption events in almost real time with XMM, that we'll find a bright enough one that will get uh, a good X-ray spectrum with, a, for instance, a good uh, iron line that we could model and therefore make a constraint on the spin. But at the moment, we don't have an awful lot of information. So uh, also with, the, with regards to the spin, we might be getting some information from the number of E Rosita tidal disruption events that have been det detected. Um, so um, I mentioned this um, earlier, the data are not out. I'm, I only know through talking to my collaborators, um, uh, I believe that the, the, they'll be publishing some of these results in, uh, in June, so ne next month. Yes, um, we the various, heard, yes. Uh, yeah. excuse me, we heard uh, from uh, um, one of the of the leaders of the groups uh, some announcements uh, mm -hmm. on the intermediate. So thank you, thank you for recalling me that. Thank you. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, these will be coming out. But I have heard that yeah, there's it will probably make it will probably make some good constraints on the spin because of the small number of tidal disruption events that have actually been detected. And magnetic fields, uh, for instance, some. Um, <laughs> well, uh, not, not yet. We're not. We're not at that point yet. 
I mean, excuse me, um, uh, very nice. Uh, because as you said, I mean, these intermediate black holes help uh, to, to, to understand or to, said to, to make uh, the picture also for supermassive black holes. And we have a, a picture for supermassive black holes set, I mean, uh, better than for intermediate, uh, as uh, I said. So, and even for, and even for, of course, for a stellar, a stellar black, hole, black hole. So, um, magnetic fields is very interesting for the picture of the accretion, collimator sheds, and so on. And this, uh, and this, fortunately, has been more or less precisely. Uh, determine it, I mean, and with polarization and all this nice image and, and more, I mean, in the, even Alma said uh, have been. And so that could be very, uh, I mean, very interesting to, to, uh, to formulate a program with Irosita, with, I mean, it uh, becomes very mature now. I mean, of course, uh, all you, it's Emma, Chandra, um, um, and so it could be very interesting to, to have this set of parameters for intermediate black hole or for globular cluster, because that appeared, I mean, some uh, said a few, few, very few years ago, uh, some um, likely impossible set, because it was very isolated, uh, some intermediate or some kind of that it was not possible to think in, in these terms. So thank you. I, I, I suggest, I mean, at least I, what I suggested for Irosita too and others. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I see no more questions. Uh, so if you, if there is no more question, let's thank um, Natalie again, and uh, we will stop the recording.